So today we're going to talk about diet formulation. The objectives of this lesson are to describe what information is needed in order to formulate a diet, describe the nutrients most likely to be important in diet formulation, and formulate balanced diets for any class of livestock in any stage of production. After this lesson, you should be able to design a diet that meets the animal's nutrient requirement and provides the maximum or optimum economic return to the livestock producer. Remember, feed represents at least 60% of the total production costs in most systems. So remember, least cost formulation is an important goal in diet formulation for livestock. So some terms to be aware of. Firstly, a balanced diet. A balanced diet is one that provides the nutrient needs of an animal in the proper proportion. So remember when we discussed amino acids in the diet, it's not just the quantity that's important, but the balance of those amino acids in the diet, the balance of those minerals, the balance of all of the nutrients to support the needs of the animal. Ration is the amount of diet required to meet an animal's need during a 24-hour period. So when we use the word ration, we're referring to the amount of feed that the animal is consuming during a day. So what information do we need to know in order to formulate a diet for an animal? Well, firstly, we need to know the nutrient requirements of the animal. We need to know the nutrient composition of the feedstuffs that are available to include in that diet. And we also need to know the bioavailability of those nutrients to the animal. In addition to that, we also need to be aware of any non-nutritive characteristics of the feedstuffs. For example, palatability, pelleting properties, associative effects, whether they contain any toxins or anti-nutrient factors for example. And also, very importantly, we need to be aware of the cost of available feedstuffs. Remember, the goal is a least cost formulation. So in terms of meeting the animal requirements, remember that first we must meet the maintenance requirements of the animal. And once those maintenance requirements have been met, then we want to meet the requirements to support performance including growth, finishing, lactation, egg production, and work. Okay, so which nutrients are important to balance for when we formulate a diet? Well, protein is very, very important. And usually the first nutrient that we balance for when we formulate a diet. And some terminology to refresh your memory that we use in association with protein is crude. Remember crude protein, which is determined based on the nitrogen content of the feedstuff and may also include non-protein nitrogen. So it's a crude measure of protein. Digestible protein, which can be determined based on a feeding trial. Remember we discussed methods for measuring the apparent or true digestibility of protein. And also the amino acids. So rather than balancing for total protein alone, also making sure that we balance for those individual amino acids, making sure that they're present um, in appropriate amounts as well as an appropriate balance relative to each other because of some potential antagonisms and inhibitions that can occur. Also, very importantly, we want to formulate for energy, to meet the energy requirements of the animal. And this is often related to the protein level in the diet. And some terminology to refresh your memory that you should be aware of, total digestible nutrients, which is a term that we typically use in association with, say, a cattle diet or perhaps a swine diet, which refers to the total amount of digestible nutrients. Digestible energy, which remember is the gross energy minus the energy 
subtracted from the feces, metabolizable energy, which is the digestible energy minus energy that's associated with the urine and gaseous losses, and the net energy, which is the metabolizable energy minus the heat increment or heat of fermentation. So remember, basal metabolism is associated with heat loss. Conversion of energy is not 100% efficient. So when cells are operating in the body, there is a constant release of heat that's associated with energy production. And so that in calculating the net energy, that heat increment is the heat production that's associated with the absorption and metabolism of those nutrients. It's associated with the intake of the feed stuff. So on top of the normal heat production associated with metabolism in the animal. Minerals also very important to balance for. And so remember the one that we're most concerned with in any feeding situation is that calcium to phosphorus ratio which in general, in many cases, is often a two-to-one ratio. Also very important is providing salt in the diet, sodium chloride, which provides both sodium and chloride, um, and which often can be provided free choice to the animal. We know that animals have an inherent uh, preference or uh, taste for salt, and this can also be used as a vehicle to deliver other minerals in the diet. And these minerals can be provided via a premix that's either mixed into the whole diet that's fed to the animal, for example, in a broiler diet where we feed the animal a single feed, or it can be offered free choice in the case of uh, grazing cattle or grazing sheep in order to meet those mineral requirements that may not be met alone uh, through the forage or the supplements that the animal's consuming. And it's also important that we take into consideration the vitamins in the diet. And vitamins can also be delivered in the form of a premix that's meant to be mixed into the total diet that's fed to the animal or perhaps fed separately. And also in the case of our fat-soluble vitamins, such as vitamins A, D, and E, that may not be present in the uh, diet at high enough quantities to support the growth and metabolism of the animal, they could also be provided separately. And in addition to that, we should also take into consideration any non-nutritive additives, um, including those that are added to improve the flavor or palatability of the diet, any medicants uh, such as antibiotics or coccidiostats that are included into the diet uh, for the health of the animal. Essentially, anything that's added to the diet that doesn't provide uh, a nutrient to the diet. So where do we find those nutritional requirements of the animal? If I'm formulating a diet for a starter broiler chick, how do I find out what those requirements are for that broiler chick? Well, for many animals, there are published feeding standards. The biggie is the National Research Council, which we've talked about before. And you can find the latest National Research Council publications uh, for various species and uh, use those as a standard for formulating your diets. In addition to that, corporate or uh, industry may publish their own feeding standards. So, for example, I commonly work with the Cobb 500 broiler. And the last time that I formulated a diet for my Cobb 500 broiler chicks, I visited the Cobb Ventress website and utilized their feeding standards or their recommendations for formulating a diet to meet the requirements of Cobb 500 broiler chicks during the starter phase of production. And also experience, personal experience, which in many cases can be the most important source of a feeding standard. Because as we've discussed before, certain factors such as the breed, stress, the environment, so heat stress, um, quality of the forage that's being fed, um, a number of different factors can influence the nutrient utilization by the animal. So often long-term experience can be the best key to success.
Additionally, we're concerned with the stage of production and meeting those nutritional requirements. So for example, if you visit the NRC recommendations for broiler chickens, you'll notice that there are feeding standards for different stages of production. The starter phase, the grower phase, and the finishing stage of production. So as the anim animal grows, as its production needs change, so do the nutrient requirements. And these uh, nutrient requirements are expressed in units. Um, for example, a unit of diet, so a percentage of the total amount of diet, milligram per kilogram of diet, etc. Also on a per day basis, gram per day, kilogram per day, megacalories per day, international units. Um, for example, if we're talking about the biological activity of vitamin A precursors, etc. So what do these nutrient requirements represent? Well, they represent a minimum requirement for maximum production. There is no safety margin, and nutritionists may adjust based on experience. And as I've mentioned before, they do not include allowances for stress, environment, housing, breed, disease, etc. So an important take-home message is that these nutrient requirements are not necessarily uh, one case fits all uh, type of situation. Okay, the nutrient requirements of the animal can vary uh, depending on the situation. We also need to take into consideration the intake of the animal. Remembering that there are limits to what an animal can eat in terms of the maximum amount of dry matter and also that bulk, okay, for example, the presence of roughages in the diet can influence the total amount of intake on a daily basis. So in addition to formulating that diet to meet the nutrient requirements of the animal, we also need to understand just how much of that diet the animal is consuming each day in order to determine whether it's meeting the requirements of the animal. So in order to assess nutrient composition, there are numerous tables published. Uh, you can view the annual feedstuffs uh, publication for the nutrient composition of different feedstuffs. If you visit the NRC uh, requirements for different species, there are tables published, and you can use these as a rough estimate to determine, for example, in soybean meal, how much crude protein it contains, how much metabolizable energy if I'm formulating the diet for a broiler chicken, how much calcium it contains, how much phosphorus, etc. Nutritionists and feed manufacturers often develop their own database. And a really important point here is that the composition of feedstuffs is highly variable. Depends on where it's grown geographically. Remember how I emphasized during our early discussions of feedstuffs, uh, how forages, how hays, how silages can vary depending on how the forage is grown harvested, and stored. And so in order to um, understand or to better formulate a diet for an animal based on the nutrient composition of the feedstuffs, it's important um, when, of, when you're able to, to analyze the composition of those feedstuffs. And remember, uh, Ying gave a very nice lecture on methods for analyzing feedstuffs, including proximate analysis to determine crude protein, to determine crude fat, crude fiber, um, the Van Soost analysis for determining neutral detergent fiber and acid detergent fiber, um, and also to get at those energy requirements of the animal, you can carry out um, digestibility trials and um, carry out those trials to determine the availability of the nutrients to the animal. But again, composition of feedstuffs can be highly variable and it is very important um, when possible to analyze the composition of the feedstuffs on a regular basis. Now in terms of nutrient availability, once we've determined the nutrient composition of a feedstuff, 
it's important to recognize that those nutrients are not completely available. Okay, in general, there is going to be incomplete digestion and or absorption. So for example, if we're talking about a protein, that protein may not be 100% digested down to free amino acids and small peptides. So, di so it may not be completely digested into forms that the animal can actually absorb. And then from those amino acids and peptides that are in a form that can be readily absorbed, uh, the amount there may exceed the absorption capacities of the gut or for some reason or other may not be efficiently absorbed. Okay, so in general, a limitation of these nutrient composition tables is that they don't specify the biological availability of a feedstuff. And nutrients of particular concern are protein, energy, and minerals. And some non-nutritive characteristics to be aware of. Again, uh, factors that aren't uh, indicated in a published table of the nutrient composition of feedstuffs, but which markedly affect uh, how much of a diet that an animal consumes and also how available those nutrients are to the animal. So the palatability, the overall taste and texture um, of the diet and how it appeals to the animal for consumption. Associative effects. This is a biggie. Okay, you can analyze the composition and digestibility of feedstuffs alone, but when those feedstuffs are consumed in combination, different nutrients may interact with each other to affect digestion and absorption. So, for example, the digestible, digestible energy of a forage may be lower when it's fed with a concentrate. The digestible energy of a low-quality forage may increase. Also important are how the feeds are processed and how they're handled. So for example, pelleting or processing the feed in some way that may improve the feed intake or improve the digestion and absorption of the nutrients. And also handling and storage of the feed. For example, if the feed is stored in such a way that encourages mold growth, then it becomes uh, highly unpalatable to the animal and may contain toxins uh, that are harmful to the animal. And so again, an important goal of uh, diet formulation is least cost. Okay, to provide the most economical diet available that supports the needs of the animal. And as I emphasized before, feed represents the largest cost in animal production between 50 and 80 percent, depending on the production systems. And so with that in mind, there are important decisions to be made when formulating a diet, whether to produce a feedstuff or buy that feedstuff. And factors that affect the cost and thus the decision whether or not to buy a feedstuff, including the supply of that feedstuff, the availability of suitable alternatives, transportation costs, as well as storage costs of the feedstuff. Okay, so some key points in diet formulation. Firstly, to supply nutrients needed for a balanced diet. And as I've already alluded to, in general, we typically balance for protein first, then we check the energy levels and make sure that the energy requirements have been met. We ensure that the calcium and phosphorus levels and ratio are correct. We make sure that we've added salt to the diet. So in general, if we're talking about a non-ruminant diet, 025 to 0.5% of the total diet. We also want to make sure that we're using the correct vitamin and mineral Premixes, And as we're going to discuss later on in the semester, there are some important species-specific differences in the tolerance to different levels of minerals in the diet and also specific metabolic needs or requirements that differ according to species. And then finally, include additives as needed. Okay, so secondly, where do you find the information? And as I've mentioned before, NRC can be uh, an important source of information for published feeding standards. Okay, so today we're going to talk about methods of diet formulation by hand. 
And those methods include the use of simultaneous equations, algebraic methods, my personal favorite, Pearson square, substitution methods, and if we're not formulating by hand, we can formulate by a computer, which is my preferred method of diet formulation. Okay, and this uh, takes into use uh, linear programming. Okay, and linear programming involves the simultaneous solution of many different linear equations in order to determine the optimum combination. And it will also formulate a least cost diet. You can enter the cost of different ingredients and it will use those equations to make sure that the diet is balanced using the least expensive ingredients. Now there are a number of different software packages that are available from different companies, Agridata Systems, Feedsoft, Brill, etc. Okay, and in general, these software packages are a bit pricey. Um, and also, one of the limitations that I found in implementing these from an education perspective is that uh, there are very few that are Mac compatible. And so with that being said, um, I decided against having a mandatory or required uh, software package um, assignment or requirement this semester but rather what I'd like to do for those of you who are truly interested in diet formulation or foresee yourself uh, being involved in more applied nutrition in the future, please see me. And if you're interested, we could discuss an independent study for next semester that involves using these software packages to formulate diets. And when I took animal nutrition and feeding more than a decade ago, I never envisioned myself um, maybe using uh, the software from an applied standpoint. And it's quite interesting now. I consider myself a molecular biologist, a very basic scientist, but I do, in fact, use this formulation software on a daily basis, and I find it very powerful, very useful, and it's also enjoyable, I think, uh, to use these software packages to formulate diets. So again... Um, if you're interested in learning more, getting more experience, please come see me and we'll make that happen. Okay, so firstly, a very important aspect of formulating diets is expressing your um, nutrients, your requirements, your amounts in the diet on a consistent basis. Okay, and you need to be able to shift efficiently between an as-fed and a dry basis. Okay, so an as-fed basis is the composition of the feed as it is fed to the animal. Okay, so this takes into account the moisture composition of the feed stuff. On a dry basis is just that, with the moisture excluded, the dry composition of the feed. Okay, now the importance of this is that feedstuffs vary on the amount of moisture that they contain, and this thus masks or dilutes out the dry matter composition of the feed, the nutrient density. Okay, and also, if you're expressing some requirements on a dry basis, the others need to also be expressed on a dry basis, or vice versa, if you're using uh, numbers on an as-fed basis, um, then you need to be consistent with how you're expressing those requirements. So if you remember from some of my early lectures on plant composition, I specified each time that I showed you data for the crude protein content, the acid detergent fiber content of a feedstuff, I was very clear in whether those numbers were on an as-fed or a dry basis. So it's very important that you are able to interchange between the two. So the which we use, it depends largely on how the nutrient composition of the feed ingredients are expressed and also personal preference. The key is that you need to be consistent. Okay, so on the screen here, you can see an example of a feedstuff. And on the left, we see the feedstuff on an as-fed basis. Okay, it contains the dry matter, the nutrients, the ash, and then it also contains water, moisture content. Okay, then on the right side of this, of this picture, 
that feeds stuff on a dry matter basis. Okay, when we remove the moisture, all that's left is dry matter. Okay, so if we're talking about the crude protein content of a feedstuff, the percent of crude protein is going to be lower on an as-fed basis on the left than it is on a dry matter basis, as expressed on the right. Because on the left, as you can see with the presence of water, that water is diluting out the amount of protein that's present on a total basis. Okay, so to give you an example here, let's say that we have a sample of corn grain. And it's determined to contain 8.9% crude protein, and it's 90% dry matter, and this is on an as-fed basis. Okay, so how do we express that crude protein on a dry matter basis? Very simple. We divide that 8.9 by the dry matter content, 0.90 which is 9.9%. So the crude protein content of the corn grain is 9.9% on a dry matter basis. Okay, one easy way to make sure that you are performing this calculation correctly is that on an as-fed basis, the nutrient amount should be lower than on a dry basis. Because remember, on a dry basis, you're taking out the moisture so it's more concentrated. Okay, so... That's an indication of whether you need to divide by the dry matter content, okay, or to multiply. Okay, so here's another example. We have corn silage, and on a dry basis, it's 7.9% crude protein, and it's 36.4% dry matter. How do we express that crude protein on an as-fed basis? So quick question, will the percent crude protein be greater than or will it be less than the dry matter on an as-fed basis? So if we're shifting from the dry matter basis to an as-fed basis, should the percent of crude protein increase or decrease? So remember, when we're going to an as-fed basis, it's with moisture included, it's diluting out the nutrient, so it should decrease. Okay, so if we take the 7.9% crude protein, multiply that times our dry matter content, 0.364, 2.88% crude protein on an as-fed basis. Okay, going from a dry basis to an as-fed basis, there is a reduced percentage of crude protein. As I said, you need to be able to calculate dry matter or an as-fed basis for this class. Okay, and so you either divide by the amount of dry matter or multiply times the amount of dry matter in order to make that conversion. And again, a quick and easy way to make sure that you've performed the correct calculation is simply remembering or understanding that on a dry matter basis, that density or amount of nutrients should be greater because you've removed the moisture and you've concentrated it. All right, so let's solve our first problem. Let's formulate a feed that contains 16% crude protein as fed. Okay, the ingredients that are available to us to formulate this feed include corn, which is 8.5% crude protein, and cottonseed meal, which is 41.7% crude protein. And let's use several methods in order to formulate this feed, including simultaneous equations, the algebraic method, and my personal favorite, Pearson's square. Okay, so first, let's try solving this problem using simultaneous equations. So first, let's write our equation. We have two ingredients that should equal 100. So x plus y equals 100 where X equals the percent of cottonseed meal, abbreviated CSM, and Y equals the percent of corn. Okay, so now let's write our protein equation. Okay, and this is based on the crude protein percent, or the crude protein content of the ingredients. 
Remember, our corn was 8.5% crude protein, and our cottonseed meal was 41.7% crude protein. So if the cottonseed meal is X and the corn is Y, and we multiply those times the respective amount of crude protein, we have 0.417X plus 0.085Y equals 16. Remember, we want to formulate the diet to contain 16% crude protein. This is our protein equation. Okay, the next step is to rearrange your simplest equation. Okay, so remember, our two equations are first the ingredient equation, x plus y equals 100, and our protein equation, 0.417x plus 0.085y equals 16. Our most simple equation is x plus y equals 100. So if we want to solve for x, the equation becomes x equals 100 minus y. The next step is to substitute the simplest equation into the more complex. Okay, so we have x equals 100 minus y. Okay, we can then substitute that 100 minus y into x in the more complex equation. So we have 0.417 times x plus 0.085 times y equals 16. So if we substitute 100 minus y for x in our protein equation, we have 41.7 minus 0.417y plus 0.085y equals 16. Then, if we add together the two uh, units in the equation that have a uh, coefficient in front of y, we have a negative 0.332y equals a negative 25.7. And now we can solve for y, divide both sides by a negative 0.332, and y equals 77.4, which is the percent of corn to include in the diet. Then we solve for our... Um, feed ingredient amount equation, remember x plus y equals 100, 100 minus 77.4 equals 22.6, which is the percent of cottonseed meal to include in the diet. And we always want to check ourselves at the end, after we've solved um, for the amount of, of feed stuff to include in the diet when we're doing these hand formulations. So we've concluded that 22.6% of the diet is cottonseed meal, and that cottonseed meal contains 41.7% crude protein. And we've concluded that 77.4% of the diet is corn, which contains 8.5% crude protein. Thus, if we multiply the amount of crude protein in cottonseed meal times the amount of cottonseed meal, so 0.417, times 22.6, we have 9.42% crude protein that the cottonseed meal is contributing to the diet. If we take the amount of crude protein in the corn and multiply that times the amount of corn in the diet, 0 0.085 times 77.4, we have 6.58, which is the percent crude protein contributed to the diet by the corn. Now, if we add the two together, 9.42, the amount of protein contributed by the cottonseed meal, and the 6.58, the amount of protein contributed by the corn, we have 16.0. And remember, we wanted to formulate the diet to contain 16% crude protein. Okay, a second method for solving this problem is the algebraic method. Okay, so first, let's let X be the kilogram or amount of cottonseed meal in 100 kilograms of feed. Thus, 100 minus X would then be the kilogram or amount of corn in the 100 kilograms of feed. So, 
the amount of feed in kilograms times the desired amount of crude protein in percent would then equal the kilogram of cottonseed meal times the kilogram, or excuse me, times the percentage of crude protein in cottonseed meal plus the kilograms of corn times the percent crude protein in the corn. So remember, this is the same method that we used to check ourselves at the end of our last method for solving this problem. Okay, so we have 100 kilograms of feed, and we desire 16% crude protein. 100 times 16% would then be equal to X amount of cottonseed meal times 41.7% crude protein. Remember, that's the crude protein content of the cottonseed meal, plus 100 minus X, okay, which is what we determined at the beginning to be our amount of corn in the 100 kilogram of feed, because if cottonseed meal is X, corn would be 100 minus X, since we only have two ingredients um, as constituents of the diet, which as a total would be 100. So then that 100 minus X kilogram would be multiplied times 8.5%, which is the amount of crude protein in the corn. So 100 kilograms of diet times 0.16 equals X times 0.417 bracketed plus 100 minus X times 0 0.085 bracketed. So 16 kilograms, so we solve the left side of our equation, 100 times 0.16. So 16 kilograms equals 0.417x kilograms plus 8.5 kilograms minus 0 0.085 times x kilograms. Okay, so then... If we subtract that 8.5 from both sides of the equation, we have 16 minus 8.5 kilograms equals 0.417 times x kilograms minus 0 0.085 times x kilograms. So 7.5 kilograms equals 0.332 x kilograms. x would then equal 7.5 divided by 0.332. We divide both sides of the equation by 0.332 to solve for x. x thus equals 22.59 kilograms of cottonseed meal in 100 kilograms of feed. Then to solve for corn, 100 minus the 22.59 kilograms equals 77.41 kilograms of corn in 100 kilograms of feed. And the last step, we want to check ourselves. So in 100 kilograms of feed, we have 22.59 kilograms of cottonseed meal, which contains 41.7% crude protein. And we have 77.41 kilograms of corn that contains 8.5% crude protein. Then for the cottonseed meal, 0.417, the amount of crude protein, times 22.59, the amount of cottonseed meal in the diet, equals 9.42% crude protein. For the corn, 0 0.085, based on the percent of crude protein in the corn, times 77.41, the amount of corn in the diet, equals 6.58. We add the two together, we have 16% crude protein which is the amount of crude protein that we desired to have in the feed. Okay, let's now solve this problem using Pearson's square, which as I said is my personal favorite method to use. So for Pearson's square, you draw a box. Okay, in the middle of that box, you put your desired crude protein amount. So in this case, we want 16% crude protein. Okay, then you draw two lines with arrows that point at the two right corners of the box. So we have one line with an arrow pointing diagonally downwards to the right, and the second line that points diagonally 
upwards to the right. Okay, then we put our ingredients and their crude protein contents on the left side of the box. So let's put corn at the top, on the top left side. Corn is 8.5% crude protein. And let's put cottonseed meal at the bottom left side of the box at 41.7% crude protein. Now, very simply, we subtract the amount of crude protein from the number that's in the middle of the box using absolute values. So, for the cottonseed meal, 41.7 minus 16 equals 25.7. For the corn, 16 minus 8.5, you subtract from the larger number, equals 7.5. Now, if we add those two numbers together on the right side of our box, we have 33.2. Now, in order to determine the percent of corn in the diet and the percent of cottonseed meal in the diet, we need only to divide those numbers that we determined on the right side of the box by that total number that we determined from adding those two numbers together on the right side of the box or the square. Thus, the percent of corn in the diet would be 25.7, that was our top right number that's aligned with the corn, divided by 33.2 times 100 equals 77.41%. For the amount or percent of cottonseed meal, we have 7.5 divided by 33.2 times 100 equals 22.59% in the diet. So again, to determine the percent corn in the diet, we divide using the number that's aligned with the corn, the top number on the right side of the square. And to determine the amount of cottonseed meal, we use the number on the bottom right-hand side of the square that's aligned with the cottonseed meal. Now to check ourselves, the diet contains 77.41% corn, which contains 8.5% crude protein, and the diet contains 22.59% cottonseed meal, which contains 41.7% crude protein. Thus, the corn, 0.085, which is the, based on the amount of crude protein in corn, times 77.1, the amount of corn in the diet equals 6.58, and for cottonseed meal, 0.417, which is the amount of crude protein in the cottonseed meal times 22.59, the amount of cottonseed meal in the diet, equals 9.42. And when we add those together, we have 16% crude protein. Any questions, please let me know.